Buddha told the story one time of two acrobats, the teacher and his student. And the teacher tells the student, okay, I'm going to climb up to the end of this bamboo pole. I want you to climb up on my shoulders. And then you look out after me, and I'll look out after you, and that way we'll come down safely. And the student said, no, that won't do. I have to look out after myself. You have to look after, out after yourself. And that way, by look, each of us looking after, out after ourselves, we protect the other. So we'll be able to perform our tricks and come down safely. And the Buddha mentioned that in that case, the student was the one who was right. Because after all, for an acrobat, number one issue is keeping her balance. And you can't look out after somebody else's balance. As long as you're focused on your balance, you're not going to throw the other person off. And that way, by looking after yourself, you protect the other person. Then the Buddha went on to say it's the same with the practice. When you look out after yourself, you're looking out after others. But then he went on to say also there are times when looking out after others, you look out after yourself. The important thing is he doesn't draw a clear line between the two. There's that old complaint that Theravada is selfish, you're only looking out after yourself. But as the Buddha said, you can't help but help other people when you really are careful, when you really are meticulous, when you really do look out after your own balance. All the good things the Buddha has as practice. Generosity, virtue, cultivating the sublime attitudes, getting the mind into a good state of concentration, developing insight, gaining release. The primary focus is on what they do for your mind. But in each case, you're not only helping yourself, the people around you benefit as well. Generosity, the, the dual benefit is obvious. On the one hand, you create a more spacious mind for yourself. If you're stingy, if you're always worried about hoarding things, then your mind gets more and more narrow, more and more fixed on things, and it's a very unpleasant mind to be in. But if you can learn to be generous, the mind begins to open up. It's a more spacious mind. It's a more comfortable place to stay. At the same time, the people around you benefit from the things you give them. The same with the precepts. You look at your behavior when you're following the precepts, and there's really nothing that you can, no need to fault yourself, particularly when you've been able to do the right thing even when it was hard. The sense of self-worth, the sense of dignity, that word that we tend to forget. Another word we tend to forget is nobility. These are the things that come with the precepts. Having principles in your actions and holding on to them no matter what, whether they're convenient or not. In this way you don't harm other people. And you yourself can learn to trust yourself. Someone gives you a million dollars to lie, and you can say, no, that means that your virtue is worth more than a million dollars. You've got something valuable inside. Same when you develop the sublime attitudes. Your own mind becomes more spacious. And you're less likely to harm anybody. On top of that, the Buddha notices that when you develop an unlimited goodwill, unlimited compassion, appreciation, equanimity, if you've got any past bad karma, the effects when they hit you, when your mind is in an expanded state like that, will not nearly be as strong. makes a comparison with a salt crystal in, her, in water. He says, if you put a salt crystal into a glass of water, you can't drink it. It's much too salty. But if you put the salt crystal in a river, 
you can still drink the water because there is so much water in there. It dilutes the salt, so that doesn't really make that much difference. It says it's the same with a mind that has this unlimited quality. Any past bad actions. Whose results hit you when your mind is in a state like that? They don't hit you nearly as hard. Sometimes you've barely noticed them at all. This is another practice and the Buddha recommends in which you benefit and the people around you benefit as well. When the mind gets concentrated, again, your immediate benefit is that you have a sense of well-being inside, a sense of stability. There's a sense of peace. As the Buddha said, there is no happiness other than peace. And once the mind has that sense of stability, it has a good place where it can rest. There's a sense of fullness, rapture, that can come along with it as well. That rapture, the Buddha said, is food for the mind. When the mind is well fed like this, you don't have to go out feeding on other things outside. Your mind doesn't have to prowl around looking for other people to do this, that, or the other thing just the way you want it to be done. You're less of a burden on them. The same holds true with discernment. And of course, release when you don't have to feed at all in any way. You're no longer a predator. From that point on, all you have is things to offer to other people. The wisdom you've gained, the insights you've gained. You've got a lot more to share. So this is the Buddha's vision of the path. It's one in which there's no sharp line between your benefit and the benefit of the people around you. But the focus is working on your qualities of mind, because that is something you're responsible for. The things other people are going to do is say and think you can't be responsible for them. Only when you force someone else to do something against their will, that's when you're responsible. But there are so few cases in the world when you can really do that. Your actions, your words, your thoughts, these things you are responsible for. And so if you take good care of these, then again, it's like the acrobat maintaining his balance. You don't throw anybody else off balance, and you yourself are safe. So value this practice. The more meticulous you are in looking after your own mind, the better the results are going to be. All the Buddhist teachings are meant to focus your attention right here on what you're doing right now, both what you're doing and the results that are coming from what you're doing. The teachings on emptiness, not self, all the what seem to be the more abstract teachings are else ultimately meant to focus your attention back here. Where is the stress and suffering? What is the action that's causing that stress and suffering? And you stop it. And the more meticulously you can watch this one topic, the better the results are going to be. The more you're acquainted with your own mind, the better the results are going to be. So everything focuses here. All your activities as you live here at the monastery are meant to focus here on the mind. Not only while you're sitting here meditating, but all the other activities. You want to stay in touch with the state of your mind as precisely and meticulously as possible. Because this is the source of pleasure or pain for which you're responsible. To learn to value it. Learn to give it the importance it deserves. <laughs>